Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of the Suzanne Benker Show, where we tell truths that culture won't. As always, this program is brought to you by Hair Saloon for Men. Hair Saloon is filling a void in American life that has as much to do with the restoration of men as it does with the business of haircutting. Men and women are different, and that's a good thing. At Hair Saloon, the TVs are always tuned into sports and never to Oprah. So head on over to hairsaloon.com. They have 18 locations in St. Louis, Pittsburgh, Boston, and Houston. Book online or through their mobile app. Again, that's hairsaloon.com for men against the grain. You've no doubt read a headline or two that asks where all the good men have gone. Indeed, the relationship between the sexes has never been more tenuous. And while there's more than one reason for this, at its core is a very significant phenomenon that gets almost no coverage in the media. The demotion of the American male. There is unquestionably a war on men in America. Just this year, the APA made controversial headlines when they issued their first ever guidelines to help psychologists work with men and boys. Thirteen years in the making, the APA claimed their guidelines draw on more than 40 years of research and show that traditional masculinity, quote, is psychologically harmful, end quote. The takeaway is clear. There's something inherently wrong with men. My next guest says men have heard this message loud and clear and are either consciously or unconsciously going on strike. They're dropping out of college, leaving the workforce, and avoiding marriage and motherhood at alarming rates. But men aren't dropping out because they're stuck in arrested development. They're acting rationally in response to a system that's increasingly stacked against them. They're going on strike because they don't want to be injured by the laws, attitudes, and hostility against them for the crime of being male in the 21st century. Dr. Helen Smith is a psychologist who specializes in men's issues and is the author of the book, Men on Strike, Why Men Are Boycotting Marriage, Fatherhood, and the American Dream. She holds a Ph.D. from the University of Tennessee as well as two master's degrees. She's also the author of The Scarred Heart, Understanding and Identifying Kids Who Kill, and was writer and executive producer of Six, a documentary about the murder of a family in Tennessee by teens from Kentucky. She has worked with men as well as with women and children in her private practice for more than 20 years and has been on countless television and radio shows. Helen joins me now from Tennessee. Welcome, Helen. Thank you so much for having me on, Suzanne. It's an honor. Thanks for coming on. I got to tell everybody that Helen's, Helen's, we're kind of friends. I can't remember how it all happened, (laughs) how we met. Oh, yeah. I really don't. We uh, probably met online. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. And of course, we were both covering, you know, I'd written The War on Men, and you wrote Men on Strike. And so I had something to do with that. And then we eventually found each other at a um, men's conference together. But um, that was awesome. That was awesome. And I I don't think I've seen you. Oh, yes, I did when you came through St. Louis. I did. That's right. Um, So you wrote in your book, Men on Strike, that one of the first clients you had was a wheelchair bound man named John who was being mm-hmm. beaten by his wife, and that your entire career took a turn after that experience. Would right. you say that was the beginning of your, I don't know, expertise in men's issues or being focused on that? Um, I think that was the, the impetus, that was sort of the motivating factor that got me thinking that men weren't getting such a fair shake. Because when I was younger than that, this was in my early 20s when I was working with him. And before that, I was probably grew up sort of, you know, with that whole feminist type thing, thinking that, you know, I, I I always thought things should be fair. I was never a feminist in the sense I was always an equity feminist, very much into like people should be equal, men and women should be equal. And I felt like it w- when I saw for myself that things weren't equal. I couldn't go out and get help for this man who was being beaten by his wife. He was in a wheelchair, and it was it was just. You know, there wasn't anywhere I could send him. There was no help at that time. This was in New York City, and there just wasn't anything available. And that really was the thing that got me thinking, you know, and and really turning towards men's issues and and taking more men into my practice till, you know, at a point later on, I specifically dealt mostly uh, with men's issues. Yeah, because of that uh, other book you had written, because you're getting uh, with kids who kill? Was yes, that, I wrote that, a book yeah. in the late 90s on kids who kill, and one of the things I found is it was very, you know, got, kids who shoot up schools was my main mm-hmm. interest at a later point, but that also was very similar in the sense that it's men, and I think men and boys who have a lot of anger, and at the time, and, and, and even now with all the mass shootings that we're seeing currently in the news, everybody really believes that, oh, it's just the guns, and I was always mm-hmm. dumbfounded at that because even in the 90s, we, we had all, you know, in the later 90s, of course, we had Columbine. And there was just, I think there were so many disaffected men, uh, young men 
in our society, and I think that's such a negative, a negative thing. And I recently saw an article in Cosmopolitan talking about, um, you know, like all the men, the misogynist men who hated women. It was basically talking about some woman who was tracking these men down online. And I thought, okay, this is uh, this is sort of, you know, it's like we'll do anything we can. We'll we'll disregard any law if it involves men and you know so-called misogynist men. All it means is if a man even stands up to a mm-hmm. woman today does anything to a woman today he's called a misogynist or a hateful person and i just think men um have had such a rough time of it lately and i'm not saying these mass shootings um occur because men are you know but i do think that men and boys are treated poorly and i think you get you reap what you sow and i not that that's a justification but Mm -hmm. there is a, a terrible um i think it's a terrible societal failing that we have right now, that we don't look after our men and that we feel that men are, you know, when you're, when you're basically told, in my book, uh, Ms. Gard Hart, I talked about when kids are called criminals every day in the schools or every day in society as a teenager, people sort of become what, what people talk about. And I think for men today, if all you hear is something negative and all you see is a negativity about masculinity, you start somehow to feel that, mm-hmm. and I think that's a very negative thing. Well, what do you think? I, I mean, I, obviously, I could not agree more. I could not agree more. And what makes your work so interesting is that you're you've worked with men. You're a psychologist, and so many psychologists today, as you know, are so you know politically correct, and um, mm-hmm. you, you know just follow the the cultural line. And so they they're not they do, and then you make the, then you become you start wondering like where are men seeking therapy. <laughs> Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so this this feeds into your whole theme on, on, of course, the book Men on Strike. And you wrote in your book your reason for writing this book. And you, I'm going to quote you here. You said, my audience is the man who knows that something in today's 21st century is amiss. He can't put his finger on it, but he feels deeply that modern society has turned its back on the average male. All around you, you hear the question, where have all the good men gone? But you know instinctively that that's the wrong question. The right one is... Why have all the good men gone on strike? So why have the good men gone on strike, Helen? I think there's just less and less in, you know, I'm talking about going on strike in terms of marriage, education, careers, fatherhood. And I think that the the, the rewards for men in these fields, especially in marriage, is so much less than it used to be. And the costs and dangers are so high that I think a lot of men are opting out. And we can definitely see this, particularly online, where at least men can kind of get on and speak up. You see that on the Reddit, uh, you know, like in some of the um, forums on Reddit or other places where men can actually talk about some of these issues and give their opinions in a, in a more free manner. And I think guys just feel like there's just not that much in it for them. Um, if you're a man and you have kids, you t- in today's world, you're expected to earn a living. You're expected to come home, clean the house and fix, you know, do the dishes and everything. And, of course, if you're not able to do all of that, you're called a loser, you're called names. And then if you do actually do all those things, then you're called a beta male. So it just, <laughs> you know, you really can't win. And there's no hardly in between. Some men I've seen, some men can kind of, like, do pretty well. And that kind of brings me to, I was reading, on, you know, like your latest post about the ways men can be a mask, oh, yes. emasculation yeah. proof. Yeah. And I just, it really, really uh, spoke to me because I do think that that's so important for men. I think that um, everything in our society is about how awful men are. And I think that men have a hard time really standing up for themselves in any manner. All the men I see, honestly, in today's world are either martyrs or white knights, mm-hmm. which are those guys who basically, you know, kowtow to every woman and basically, in a way, and in a way they really want something from women. I mean, they, they I think they try to protect them in the sense that what they really want is to feel that they're getting something out of that. Um, I think there are people who... You know, like the white knights are just sort of like they're looking either for a political move or to make a woman mm-hmm. sleep with him, whatever. Mm-hmm. But there's a, there's a reason they're doing that. And what's the other group? You, I remember from your book. Oh, the that, Uncle Tim. Uh, there we go. This group. Yeah, yeah. they're, the, they're the, just the kind of beta losers who basically just um, tell women whatever they want to hear. They're the sort of feminist men, of which many are on the left. I would say white knights tend to be more conservative. Um, they're the type, even like Clarence Thomas, who uh, there was one ruling that he did uh, 
it was in terms of child support saying that, oh, men should be paying, you know, the child support and this type of thing, which, yes, maybe they should, but he was saying it was okay to go to jail. And I, I absolutely, in my book, talk about the fact that I just absolutely don't believe anybody should be put in jail for owing a debt like child support. Okay, we need to, you know what, let's pick that up in just one minute. i got to go to a quick break. We'll just talk about exactly what you just said. Are you unhappily single? Does your marriage or relationship feel hard? I get a lot of emails from readers who are struggling in their marriage or relationship. Unfortunately, the help an individual or couple needs can rarely be answered in a series of emails. For this reason, I offer relationship coaching for those who are struggling to find love and for couples whose marriage or relationship feels stuck in a negative cycle. Go to SuzanneBanker.com and sign up today for a coaching session with me and learn the tools you need to find love and sustain it. It's so much easier than you think. That's SuzanneBanker.com. Welcome back to the Suzanne Venker Show. You can find out more at SuzanneVenker.com. We're talking today with Dr. Helen Smith, a writer and psychologist who specializes in men's issues. She's the author of Men on Strike, Why Men Are Boycotting Marriage, Fatherhood, and the American Dream. And we left off talking about these different types of men that, different groups of men, I guess you could say, that exist today as a result of this massive shift in the last 40 years of um, you know, living in an anti-male society and being very antagonistic towards men and what men have done in response. And you were saying, Helen, that um, you feel very strongly about not um, having men or whoever go to jail as a result of, of being in debt and not paying child support. Do you want to expound right, on well, that? Well, we have not, you know, we have debtor's laws. I thought we passed those years ago to say, look, uh, you know, if you owe money, should you really be going to jail? Second of all, why should a man, I mean, how is it going to help to put somebody in jail? I mean, this thing, they did a study in Massachusetts, uh, I think it was fathers and families at that time. They did a study and they found that something like 96% of the people put in jail in Massachusetts were men, only 4% of women. And the majority of people who are paying child support are are men. Uh, Women rarely pay child support. If they do, women are found to be in arrears all the time, but nobody sends the women to jail. It's mainly just men. And, you know, I... I just think that, that nobody should be sent to jail. Um, and a lot of times, remember, dads are paying for children that are not theirs. By law, they have to pay for kids, even if that child is found later on not to be their child. There are, there are places, I think in Tennessee, we've been working on some of those laws where if you find out after so, so much time that the child isn't yours, you can appeal or something. Yeah. But in most states, and, in, and you know, you have to pay that child support, even if the child is found to be, not be yours. And it's just that any time a man's involved, um, it just seems like we have laws on the books that say, hey, you know, it's a man. And I've literally got, had men in my practice that are so used to going to jail. Like I had a guy once tell me, oh, yeah, my son was put in jail for child support. And men don't even think about it. It's just, oh, yeah, I went to jail or my son went to jail. Like, would a woman do that? No. We, don't, we just don't put women in jail the way we put men in jail for any little thing. And I just – I think that um, – you know, child support, you know, if you look at it as a moral issue, should you pay for your children? Yes. Would I? Yes, of course, you should. But then should the government come and put you in jail if if you don't pay or you pay, you know, late or, you know, it just seems to me that it's it's kind of defeating the purpose. Um, and I don't think it's helpful to the child at all if dad's in jail. Okay, I want to go back now to what you were talking about before with with marriage specifically and how that's become not as, um, you know, it's just a better deal for women than it is for men. And so much of that has to do, as you were explaining, that it's not as though men can um, um, be primarily responsible for providing for their family, although they're still expected to do that as much as they ever yes, were. Yes, and in fact, the Pew but, Research but, Center did a study, and they found that when that the majority of people still expect men to provide for families, particularly, you know. Right, and and, and that's all fine, except when you're adding on to that, oh, and by the way, when you come home, you're not going to have any moment to breathe, and you're going to have no time for yourself, and there's no place where you can go as a man and be alone with men, because well, those spaces are gone, yada, 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 so basically, you're a slave to your life. So mm-hmm. that that's, has a lot to do with one of the things that makes marriage not so fun for men. And so um, that has everything to do, as you know, with feminism and the idea that 
the way it used to be when gender roles were more um, segregated, when they were very defined or what have you, that it was somehow a bad deal for her and a great deal for him. And, I, of course, I've right. always rejected that premise from the get-go. And once you've rejected that premise, then everything that comes off of it is also needs to be rejected. But the idea was to equalize everybody and make everybody do the same thing. They're all going to go out to work simultaneously, full-time and year-round. Then they're going to come home and they're going to live these crazy, chaotic lives. And everything's going to be hunky-dory, <laughs> which, of course, mm-hmm. it's not working out that way at all. So men are now doing what you call a cost-benefit analysis. Could you explain right. what that is? Yeah, it's like they kind of look at it and they say, hey, the rewards for uh, marriage are low and the cost is so high. And the cost is high. I actually wrote an article when my book came out. It was for the Huffington Post of all places. And actually, they were great. They, um, I got a lot of fabulous comments um, and really good responses to that piece. But the piece looked at what are the things that happen when, uh, what, you know, what are the reasons men don't want to get married? Like what happens if you get married? And some of the things I said, for example, were, You'll lose respect. Um, You know, a couple of generations ago, men were considered, oh, he's not really an adult unless he's married. And now TV has men looking like a bunch of dorks. Um, We have all this awful stuff about men, and men who are married just seem to be kind of not worth a lot of respect. Um, Men lose a lot of friends. Um, They aren't, you know, we used to think, oh, these these abusive men, they're always keeping women from going out. Well, now it's the women who are abusive, and if if men even were, I don't know. But now women, you know, men don't have as many friends. And then everybody blames them and says, well, men just don't talk. Well, they would have talked, but all the male spaces, like you were saying before, and like you pointed out in one of your articles, is we don't have any male spaces anymore. And I think that's a really big piece of uh, that's missing. Um, if we don't have male space, you know, what we've done is we've retreated men who are married. Oh, you'll have a man cave down in the basement or the dirty area of the house in the garage. Um, it was, I just think that being married for men means that there's just a lot of freedoms and things that they don't have anymore. And you could say the same, well, women will tell me. Um, oh, well, we don't have freedom, and it's the same kind of thing for us. But the law, what I'm talking about, when I talk about men's issues, I'm talking about the political and societal things that are happening right now, not necessarily what's happening in, particularly in that relationship. Politically, and society, our society basically tells men that they're the, they're the ones who are going to pay. I mean, the court is, not, is, is much more favorable in general, I'm not saying in every case, to women when you go to court. Um, If there's domestic abuse, generally it's a man who's going to pay for that, even if it's a woman beating him. Um, If a woman tells a man what to do, which in many cases I see so many wives who are always telling men Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what to do. If the man says anything or speaks up in any way, he's either seen as a a monster, uh, he's seen as the problem. Uh, The woman has been told over and over by society that she's the empowered one now. There used to be something called coverture, and coverture was in the old days. uh, um, It was that the man owned the rights to the marriage. But all that really meant was the man would go to jail if the woman did anything. I mean, there weren't really that many great things for men. There were some good things and there were some bad things. But now coverture belongs to the woman. And coverture means that the woman basically owns the rights to the marriage, and she can kind of tell the guy what to do. And, and I'm talking about in the eyes of the law, mm-hmm. and you can people can talk all they want. Well, not in my case or whatever, but I was talking about in generalities. And in most cases, if there's alimony to be paid, it's paid by the man. I think women pay something like 3% yep. of alimony, and then they bitch about it. Um, there's so many like articles and things about, oh, my God, I'm a woman. I had to pay alimony. But it's 3% of the time. So of the alimony that's being paid... 90-something percent is being paid by men. So, I mean, yeah, you know, it's, it's men have the most to lose. So I think when I, we talk about the cost-benefit for men, men have to weigh it more heavily than a woman. Women can just get a divorce. Mm-hmm. And, in fact, we know that women initiate 70-something percent of those divorces, and they do it because they know that they ultimately can get something if they have assets usually they're either going to be split equally or she's going to get more if they have children. She doesn't really need to worry that she's going to not have any custody. Mm-hmm. She's going to at least get half, if not the full full mm-hmm. custody. Um, and so I just think there are a lot of things in today's today's political climate and legal climate where men have to really weigh these things. And we don't have any classes for men. We don't have mm-hmm. anything. Nobody teaches men. And that I, I, one thing I want to point out is, in today's world, men, because they have no role models, they usually maybe don't have a dad, they don't yep. have a good relationship with their dad, where are they even going to learn anything? I mean, they're all emasculated because they, nobody tells them how to 
behave anymore. Mm-hmm. Here's an example. I was at a diner the other day, and there's this poor young guy. He's maybe 16, 17 years old. He goes up and talks to the owner of the diner, who's a man in his 80s, and he was crying and saying, I need help because I got drunk last night, and I, you know, I, I, my girlfriend, I don't, I did something to, you know, like I, I, we got in a fight, and now she won't talk to me. So he's asking the older man for help, and the older man just looked like he didn't really want to deal with it. But he said, okay, write her a love letter. I almost stopped the guy and looked at him and said, just stay away from her. Don't talk to her, and don't go. just literally ignore her. And I bet, I bet you she will be crawling back to you within three days. You know? <laughs> you said that, or you wanted to say that? I wanted to say that. I didn't say it, but I thought, well, I'll just stay out of it because, you know, I was just sitting there eating. Yeah. And um, But I thought, well, this is the advice men are getting. The guy, the poor boy, he probably has no dad to talk yeah. to. He's talking to the owner of the diner who's in his 80s. He probably figures it's the only older man. Men are the only ones left who have any idea. Um but I just don't think men have any role models in any manner. They don't have any male teachers in the schools. The, uh, the percentage of male teachers is, so, is very, very uh, marginal. Uh, there are, there, you know, a lot of guys don't have a dad in the home. If they do have a dad, he's, he's emasculated himself. But yeah. basically just says, please, a woman. That's yeah. her. He, that was this guy's take. I mean, really, do you think writing a love letter to a girl who's at you is really going to, you know, it depends what it is, but... Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. when we come back, I'm going to piggyback off of what we're saying about, about all this. Okay, we're going to take one break and be right back. Welcome back to the Suzanne Venker Show. You can find out more at SuzanneVenker.com. This program is brought to you by Hair Saloon for Men. At Hair Saloon, customers receive a complimentary hot or cold beverage as well as a shoe shine, hot towel, and mint. At Hair Saloon, they don't offer coupons because they don't need to. Their prices are always reasonable, and customers never feel shortchanged when they walk out the door. So head on over to HairSaloon.com. They have 18 locations in St. Louis, Pittsburgh, Boston, and Houston. Book online or through their mobile app. Again, that's HairSaloon.com. We're talking today with Dr. Helen Smith, a writer and psychologist who specializes in men's issues. She's the author of Men on Strike, Why Men Are Boycotting Marriage, Fatherhood, and the American Dream. And we left off um, talking about where young boys are supposed to learn how to be men because, of course, they're missing fathers or father figures, which is a huge issue. Um, In fact, so much so that I find it funny, going back to the, the gun issue that we're talking about, it's to me, it's such a simple it, – it, how can you not look at what's happened when you have a major social change like this, a, a phenomenon, and not look back over this past several decades and ask ourselves, so what's different? You know, what what is it that's different today that wasn't here 40, 50 years ago? And do we honestly believe that the last crop of women just gave birth to a bunch of bad boys? I mean, there must was there something in the water? Or can we be a little deeper with our thought here? And so in your book, um, you one of the things that makes your book different is that rather than being condescending toward men as as you know, in masculinity, you're asked instead, what is it about our society that's made growing up seem so unattractive to these men? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think those are important issues. And going back to the mass shooting issue, I think there are many, many things that are very, very complex. Anytime someone kills like that, it's obvious it's a complex issue. And I think we have to go to, uh, you know, uh, Warren Farrell and John Gray mm-hmm. recently wrote the book last year, a couple of years ago, uh, The Boy Crisis, mm-hmm. looking at, you know, the missing dads. Um, I think there's more to it than that. I truly believe there's part of it is the schools, uh, because I think the schools are so feminized now. Boys don't really have a say. They're treated quite poorly in the schools, um, but not just treated poorly. I think they're, they're – I'm reading a really great book now. It's called Why Meadow Died, and it's about the um, – there was the Florida school shootings at Marjorie Douglas High School, and um, it's a book about – some of the policies and some of the safety issues, um, I think there are no consequences anymore for kids. I think that's a huge thing. I think we have so few consequences. Uh, and I saw this in my practice with boys growing up. Uh, I had boys as young as eight years old do things like slash tires. I had a boy who was, you know, at 12 he murdered, and before that he was stealing cars at like 11. And each time they would let, they would not do anything. There were no consequences. So I think one of the things that's happened in our society is a simultaneous situation for boys, which is that we treat them very poorly, 
and we talk about toxic masculinity, and at the same time, there are no consequences. People, adults act like a bunch of idiots. Adults go around and they just, they, there are no consequences for anything. Mm-hmm. There's this politically correct situation in the schools. They're um, lazy about and, it. It's laziness. And they're right, lazy. And, yeah, yeah. Um, it's not just laziness. You actually get accolades, especially under the Obama administration, where there's just accolades for being a politically correct Well, moron. yeah, right. You know, so you both adults are really seeking out fame and fortune. A lot of them feel very, you know, and and, and it's hard. It's uh, very hard for teachers. Teachers don't have any rights anymore. I mean, teachers today are basically left with um, trying to deal with literally, you know, we mainstream a lot of kids. Uh, I think that's what happened in this one case in the Florida shooting, which was the Marjorie Douglas, uh, Stoneman Douglas. That was I think there was a lot, you know, kids are always mainstream now, um, and some of those kids who have behavioral problems are put in regular classrooms. So that's another change. I guess what I'm trying to do is point out to you there are many, many changes that have occurred in the last, you know, 50 years in our society. I don't think there's any one thing that you can just point at, like people just say, oh, it's the guns. Really? Mm-hmm. Okay, let's take every gun away. You'll still have these things going on. I mean, we, we have, even in Japan, people get out with a machete and, mm-hmm. you know, and use it to hurt people. Um, but going back specifically to boys and men, I do think that this negativity of talk, when we, every time we talk about toxic masculinity, every time we do that, we're, we're, we're putting a little bit more toxicity out into mm-hmm. the atmosphere against boys and men and i think that adds a little bit more um understanding of why it is that men in our society are acting out in the way they do and i think those who are most vulnerable act out in the most horrendous of ways yeah i I couldn't agree more and actually that makes me think about um how you said that many in your book that so many so-called experts are wrong when they say men or you can even say boys, young, young, younger men are poor communicators, and you wonder. Well, you, you say all you know. You have them raised in this environment, and then you complain that they're not communicating properly. <laughs> um, well, I don't know what you'd expect, really. But at any rate, your experience working with men and boys mm-hmm. in private practice, you said, mm-hmm. go, uh, proves that that the, what experts say about men not being good communicators is not true at all. So when we come back from break, I want you to expound upon that and explain the disconnect there and what you saw in your own private practice. Do you ever wonder what happened to courtship and find yourself longing to go out on a real date? Do you ask yourself why some marriages last and others fall apart? Is your marriage struggling despite your best efforts to keep it together? Women who win at love don't have a gift you don't have. What makes them unique is that they aren't at war with the men in their lives. Rather than take a competitive approach to relationships, as the culture teaches, they accept that men are men and that women are women. And that makes all the difference. Whether you're single and mapping out your life, or you're divorced or unhappily married, women who win at love will permanently alter the way you view men in marriage. You will learn the eight dating rules that lead to marriage, why super successful women struggle in love, what men want and what women want, hint, they're not the same, why love alone is not a reason to get married, how to avoid the green grass syndrome, and why acting like a man lands women in a ditch. Women Who Win at Love is an in-depth examination of modern dating and marriage and a wake-up call for women at every stage of life. So go to Amazon.com and type in Women Who Win at Love and get ready for your life to change. And of course, the Suzanne Venker Show would not exist if it weren't for the good folks over at Hair Saloon for Men. And twice a month, the CEO of hair saloon tom twelman or his son tom jr joins us for a conversation about uh, what's new at in their business and then as well as the topic of topics on my program which are as dear to them as they are to me so we have tom jr on the line today hi tom hi suzanne how are you doing just fine good good glad, glad to be joining you today excellent so what's new at hair saloon well, um, you know, we, we're of course in the in the middle of August, so uh, you know we've got uh, kind of the little bit of a rush for for back to school haircuts and you know the young men and and some of the uh, the college age kids coming in and, and getting uh, getting tidied up, I guess, for for school and that first day. But um, you know, really, what, what's kind of exciting recently is we we uh, over Father's Day we had a uh, a month long contest that we uh, that we run and and this year was a giveaway of of new camping gear uh and so my father just spent some time uh spending some time with the, the grand prize winner 
uh, at one of our locations here in St. Louis and, and met with him and his young son and uh, got to give him the giveaways and, and the, the prize package and um, you know, it was kind of neat to, uh, my, you know, my father told me that, you know, the, the young man just, they, they went camping recently and their tent broke. So, oh. you know, we gave away, you know, tent <laughs> and sleeping bags and, and kind of the gear to let them uh, be able to spend some time together as a family and, and as a, you know, father-son kind of thing. So yeah. it, it was fun to, to do. So That's so great, all those extra yep. things you do. And it's um, perfectly in line with the person I'm going to be interviewing today because we're going to talk about, about the decline of male Spaces. That's one of the things that we're going to discuss. Yeah. And, of course, Hair Saloon is one of those few places that's trying to fill that void as far as giving a real good male space where, um, it, you know, things are geared toward, towards men and boys. That's absolutely right. You know, we, you know, my father, when he started the company, you know, 20-plus years ago, um, you know, it was kind of the, the reinvention of the neighborhood barbershop. You know, so, you know, my, my generation, I, you know, I, I never – got to experience that so much you know but um it was kind of trying to you know my dad was trying to bring back that that father-son you know experience and kind of a ritual that that fathers and sons did uh together and so that's one thing that that's really important to what we do you know we we encourage that father-son visit um you know of course you know the barbershops aren't you know around and, and and what we do is not necessarily you know the traditional barbershop way you know i mean we've got you know, young women that, that work for us that, you know, um, it, it's not just a male only, uh, establishment in that regard, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's a great place for, for a young man and, and their, and their sons to come in and spend some time together. And, you know, I've got friends and, you know, brothers and, and my own kids that, that love to do it and, uh, love to visit the store. So it's a, it's an experience that, uh, we definitely encourage, uh, as, as a father and son. Excellent. Well, like I said, it fits so well into um, what I'm going to be talking about today with with Helen Smith, and uh, I think you've had a chance to to um, hear the program. So I, I didn't know if you had anything you wanted to add as far as this issue of men being on strike today and what you're seeing maybe in your world with re- with respect to that issue. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think what it is is, is kind of. You know, I mean, I'm going to let the experts talk talk about the the the, the details of it, if you will. But um, you know, that's one thing that my that we tried to address, or what my father addressed when he founded this company, was he kind of saw the writing on the wall of men were kind of being ignored. You know, not just in in our industry, in the haircutting industry, but but I think in society in general. And so the our approach and our uh, you know what what he decided to do was was to kind of go against you know what the the culture was bringing and what they were offering to men. And, and so trying to reintroduce, you know, some of those traditions and some of those uh, experiences, but, but also, um, you know, one thing that I've kind of seen as a, you know, a 40 year old with, with young sons is, you know, kind of this, you know, it, while, while media and, and kind of the, the narrative has been pushed that, you know, toxicity of manhood and masculinity and all that is, I think there's a resurgence happening, and, and, and it's kind of exciting to see. And I, I know you and I have talked a little bit about, you know, some of the people that I've connected with here locally in St. Louis, but also nationwide. And, um, you know, I'm going to drop a name of, of a guy that, that's doing some great things here locally is uh, Larry Hagner of the Good Dad Project. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, podcasts and social media, I, I think that's the positive piece is that, you know, we can connect with fathers from all over the country and, connect with people that are doing the same thing, um, you know, through the digital media space. But, um, but I do think that, you know, this toxicity and the, and the, the language that, that you're hearing out in, out in society is, uh, is really putting men on edge a little bit in terms of, you know, they don't want to, you know, step on the wrong toes yep. or, you know, yep. get in trouble. So it, 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 and the unfortunate so, part is that it's moved from just sort of a, a, a demotion of the American male to an outright right. attack. And so that's, that's of course, my biggest concern because that is, of course, so far reaching in terms of its um, fallout. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So, well, thank you so much for coming in today, Tom. Is there anything else you want to add before we let you go? Yeah, the only thing is, I mean, if, if anybody wants to get in contact with us or, you know, if they're in the area, we're, we're in St. Louis. We have uh, 16 locations here, and uh, we've got locations in Boston, Pittsburgh, and, and soon to, to open up in Houston. Um, so we're, we're excited about that. So if anybody wants to get in touch with us, they can find our uh, information at hairsaloon.com. Uh, we're also franchising. So anybody interested in franchising, they can visit our website as well. So hairsaloon.com. Appreciate the opportunity, and I'm glad I was able to, to step in for, for my dad. And uh, 
hopefully represent the, uh, the the name and the and the brand well. So excellent. Good talking to you. Anytime. You too. Yep. Take care. All right. Thanks. You're a man that respects quality over quantity. You value relationships that can stand the test of time. You enjoy convenience without sacrificing comfort. At Hair Saloon for Men, we get it. We're restoring the time-honored tradition of delivering a haircut experience men across all generations can depend on. Because sometimes the man everyone depends on needs a place of his own to depend on. The experience goes well beyond the haircut. With every perfect haircut service, you receive a complimentary beverage, a relaxing shampoo, a hot towel and mint for the perfect finish, and remember to take advantage of the complimentary shoe shines. While today's world is filled with numerous clip joints and fancy salons, Hair Saloon is building something better, something different. Book appointments online 24-7, and walk-ins are always welcome. Hair Saloon, for men against the grain. Visit hairsaloon.com to find a saloon in your neighborhood or for franchising opportunities. That's hairsaloon.com. Welcome back to the Suzanne Venker Show. You can find out more at SuzanneVenker.com. We're talking today with Dr. Helen Smith, a writer and psychologist who specializes in men's issues. She's the author of Men on Strike, Why Men Are Boycotting, Marriage, Fatherhood, and the American Dream. And we left off where I was asking Helen about um, how she was noting in her book that so-called experts say men are poor communicators, but her experience working with men and boys in private practice proves otherwise. So I thought you could expound on that. Yes, I mean when I talk to men and boys in my practice, um, and I, you know, I I don't practice much anymore. This was something I did for many years, and it, it's very, you know, it's uh, as any psychologist can tell you after over twenty years, it's it's just gets pretty extreme. Exhausting. But <laughs> yeah, exhausting. <laughs> um, I would think men and boys are definitely um, do communicate. I've literally never had one that wouldn't talk. When you get somebody in a room and you and if you actually listen, people will talk to you. I think the problem is that people who um, people a don't listen, and if they do hear, they don't hear what the boy says or the man says. They listen to what they want them to be like or what they want them to say. But if you truly listen with an open mind, I think you'll hear exactly what some of the issues are. And many men and boys told would tell me things about things that had happened to them from all the way from like being treated unfairly by women to being, you know, raped in prison. I mean many, many very deep and and, and terrible things. But I think just on average that men do communicate and people talk about like um they were talking about how men don't have any empathy, women have empathy. This couldn't be more wrong. I think it's actually the opposite. I think because men have empathy, they actually care about women, and they don't want to do anything that would cause women pain, whereas <laughs> women don't mind men feeling in pain. And, in fact, most many women don't even feel that men are in pain, and they have no idea. And they'll say, well, they didn't say so, really. And if they do say so, then you call them, a, you, you, you think poorly of them, you disrespect them, you say they're toxic. If somebody talks to a person like that, the person is just going to withdraw. And I think that's what I mean when I say men have opted out. I think they've just opted out, and they're saying, you know, they just withdraw. And a lot of them don't even realize it. And I, I think that men really are so not just socialized, but I think, and, and you even say this, men in general want to do things for women. They want to care for women. I mean, on the whole, they, they do. But I think women today are making it very hard to be cared about. And most women, most men, rather than turn on women or do anything, just sort of withdraw. Exactly. And some of them, and some of them don't even know why. They're just like, I'm not interested. I don't care anymore. Somebody broke their heart or whatever, and they just said the heck with it or whatever, and they don't even try anymore because it's just, I it's think too, women, mm-hmm. you know, I just think um, people, you know, I think women always think it's a man's fault, and when you come at an issue not 50-50, when you come at it like not, it's not about us, it's all about me and what I need, then you're going to have a bad relationship. And women can think all they want. They can sit and say, hey, I'm going to, you know, I'm empowered. Well, the minute I hear a woman saying empowered, I know she has no, <laughs> like, she feels like completely like a loser. And in fact, it's, it's, it's also a way to, to receive privilege. The minute you hear someone and say they're empowered, it really means like I'm seeking out privilege for myself and responsibilities for you as a man. Women have privilege, men have responsibilities, and that's the way men in today's world, a lot of men see marriage. Not all, but many. Yeah, no question. No question. So at the end of your book, Helen, you you do offer some solutions or things that people can do to fight back against 
this cultural, uh, I don't know, I want to call it a narrative, but of course it's much bigger than that, phenomenon. What are some of those things? Well, I think one of the things mainly is to speak out when there is a problem. And I used to think it was great to speak out online and stuff, but sometimes I wonder if it's even worth it. People always just get on and drive you crazy. I mean, I wrote five or six yeah. years ago, and I swear I don't even know if it's worth your time. But I do think in a relationship it's important to speak out. I think for men in general, like if you're, if, if a woman or somebody is saying something that you disagree with and that you don't want to do, I'm not saying you have to put your foot down and yell at her or anything, but I think you just have to say, no, I'm not going to do that, or I don't feel this way, and you have to stand up for yourself. The minute you let a woman run over you or another man, one of these beta male types, the minute you let them run over you, you're done for, because people will always keep keep. They smell you know, it. They you. smell it. Yeah, they do. They smell fear. Yeah. So I think you have to do kind of what's right for you, and you have to stand up for yourself. And I think men in general, and I think that's one of the things that I do admire about the Trump era. I do think men more and more, even though they're standing, men will stand for politics. They'll stand for freedom, mm-hmm. and they'll stand for individual rights, but they will not stand for themselves, themselves because they don't see this as an individual rights issue. Men have the right to happiness. This is a state, you know. I mean, part of the American dream is a you know right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And men don't really see that they have a right to happiness because if they did, they would stand up for their their liberty in the same way that they stand up for in the political realm. And they wouldn't see this. It is not a woman's issue. Relationships aren't women's issues. <laughs> They're human issues, and you need to see them that way. Um, if you get a chance to ever write about men's issues, do it. Because we need more men's voices. We don't necessarily, it's great to hear women's voices. It's great to hear our voices. But the best thing is if men speak up, and, and there's ways to do it. Mm-hmm. Men will tell me, well, I can't speak up because, you know, no one will listen or, or they'll, they'll, you know, go after me. Well, maybe they will. But you know what? So what? People come after, I'm sure they come after you. They come after, you know, people don't like what I, I have to no, say. No, what's that like, Helen? <laughs> What's it like? What's it I mean, like? I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. I'm always very popular in any crowd I'm in. Um, I'm very unpopular for the most part, but that's okay. It's okay you and me both. Popular. That's why I love you. Know, you. At least I have you. <laughs> well, at least, you know, we got a, we got a uh, group of two here. Now, there, I, 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 that's okay. It's okay to be unpopular, and it's okay to stand up for yourself. So the thing I would say most to men is to speak up, particularly in your relationship, and, and let, if a woman's doing something, you don't need to yell or scream. You just, you know, just tell her. But no, that's not going to happen, or you, you don't feel that way. Absolutely. Um, and do it immediately. Don't wait till the woman's already, like, you know, you're already married, and then she starts, or, you know, and then you think, The well, pattern starts, down. right. Yeah. Excellent. I think it's very difficult at that point. Um, other things men can do, you know, um, I think that uh, you have to help other men. Quit denigrating other men. Men always do that. I know it's fun to trade insults and that kind of thing. Again, fine. But, like, when you see these shows where men are being beaten or, you know, guys getting kicked in the nuts or whatever, it's not funny. It's just not funny. No. Quit laughing at that. Mm-hmm. That's just, you know what, you're, you're supporting the fact that men are abused and you go along with it. Um, fight to change laws. I mean, there are these laws on the books about the way that, you know, a young guy, like a kid, somebody 13, 14 years old, if a boy has sex with a 34-year-old teacher and she gets pregnant or anything, he's blamed for it and basically has to pay child support. Well, that used to be statutory rape in some states, but hey, if it happens to a boy, it's apparently mm-hmm. just cause for, you know... Celebration. Yeah, exactly, yeah. and it's, it's ridiculous. Um, men need to teach their boys, you know, some of these things. We need to, we need to have more education for boys i really think you know i know warren farrell and other, his that group has pushed a lot for a, a you know a white house council on men and boys right. i don't know how you know exactly where that stands right now um is that important i don't know maybe but i think what's really important is that all of us stand up for our sons and our brothers and for all men um amen because if we don't you know if it's it's ridiculous. And when is it going to turn around? I mean, and how many of our guys are suffering? And I think if you have, it's not necessarily compassion, but I do think you in some part have to have some empathy mm-hmm. and some understanding that men are, their way of acting out is anger mm-hmm. and their depression is anger mm-hmm. towards outward. So when a man is angry, right. try to find out, hey, if your son's angry or whatever, try, you know, maybe take him to a, get some, get him some help, uh, hopefully from, 
one of the very few psychologists. Or yeah, you. Like You're the only one left. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm praying there's some more besides the APA council who yeah. apparently thinks that masculinity uh-huh. is toxic. Uh-huh. But one thing I want to say about that is, you know, years ago they used to think homosexuality was a disease. Mm-hmm. Was a disease. So who can trust the APA at this point? I, I quit them years ago when I found out they just weren't trustworthy. Absolutely. But unfortunately, I don't think the average, uh, you know, American understands that the APA uh, cannot understand. be trusted. I know lots of men. Yeah. People go on, men won't go to therapy and sometimes they won't go for you know because they're afraid but a lot of men um you know i think sometimes if you can find somebody who does understand and um i think there are some still some therapists out there who you know hopefully could work with men but you have to be very careful and you have to when you go to a therapist you you know ask some questions ask how they feel about male female relationships yeah you know, Inter- interview you them. An answer, mm-hmm. Yeah, interview them. And if you hear something you don't like, huh, maybe it's, they're not for you. Well, we're going to have to leave it there, Helen. This has been so great. I thank you so much for coming on. This is a great conversation, and I know it's going to help a lot of people um, in their own lives. So is there a specific place where people can go to find out more about you, Helen? Um, they can always go to pjmedia.com. And just um, I'm a columnist there. Uh, it's Dr. Helen, if you look there at pjmedia.com, you can find me. I'm also over at instapundit.com, uh, writing sometimes, so either place. Excellent. Okay. Thank you so much, Helen. Really appreciate it and hope to talk of to you course. soon. My guest today was Dr. Helen Smith, a writer and psychologist who specializes in men's issues. She's the author of Men on Strike, Why Men Are Boycotting Marriage, Fatherhood, and the American Dream. Well, that wraps up another edition of The Suzanne Venker Show. Don't forget to tune in next time when we talk with author and psychologist Sean Smith about how men can allow the right women into their lives and keep the wrong ones at a safe distance. And if you haven't done so already, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast and please, please take two minutes to give us your review. If you want to hear more, that's really the best way to make sure it will happen. Finally, if you have a comment or question, email Suzanne at the SuzanneBankerShow.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great weekend. Hair Saloon, it's more than just a haircut. You walk in the door, tired, spent, looking a bit ragged. You're greeted by a warm welcome like you've been here before. A complimentary drink slides across the bar, quenching your thirst for comfort and convenience. The sound of clippers and conversation can be heard drowning out the noise of the world. You sit comfortably, surrounded in soft leather and smooth chrome. The smell of oak and clubman talc reconnects you to traditions your father and grandfather once knew. The soothing sounds of sharp metal trim away at your problems. Staying put in a comfortable barber chair, you lay back, resting your eyes as warm water and sweet mint soap washes away your worries. You recapture a few minutes to feel strong again, to look your best, and to get ready for what's next. And you're ready to repeat again a few weeks later. Hair Saloon, for men against the grain. Visit hairsaloon.com to find a location near you. That's hairsaloon.com.